I was raised to believe that the Bible is a book of morals, that it defines good versus evil for us within its pages. In the Garden of Eden, however, there were two trees. The tree that brought death was the tree that contained the question of morals, good versus evil. The other tree was the tree that brought life to all the aid of its fruit, the tree of life. Is it possible that we've been asking the wrong questions, chasing the wrong thing by seeking to be moral? Let's run an experiment. Rather than seeking to define and live by good versus evil, let's flip the question. Let's define life instead. But to do that, we must first seek it out. So join us as we dare Shkai, as we seek life. Hello everyone, welcome to the Deir Shechai Experiment, the show where we examine scripture for the instructions that it contains for us all as we live this thing called life. This week we begin to really get to know the third and final patriarch of Israel, Jacob, this man who will later receive the name of Israel. He's a man whose life is full of blessing and hardship, the father of the twelve tribes. Jacob provides for us one of the most complicated character studies in the book of Genesis. And not only is he the third patriarch, but he will be part of the rest of the book. Jacob gets by far the most screen time of anyone else in the book of Genesis. In the first 26 chapters, we've gone from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Isaac, and we've even seen Jacob in chapter 25. The next 24 chapters are centered totally on Jacob and his children. In fact, the book ends with the death of Jacob. Now, Jacob is definitely not a perfect man. He has many character flaws that we're going to get into. Perhaps none so obvious as the one that fits his name, and the one that is the the very beginning, the opening that we are introduced to him through. So what is Jacob's name in Hebrew? Well, it is Yaakov. This name has a lot of meaning in it. The root of the name is the word akev, which simply means heel, or the back part of the foot. We've heard about a heel before, haven't we? Right? Back in Genesis 3.15. It says, And I put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall crush your head, and you shall crush his heel. That was part of the curse that was given to the serpent all the way back in Genesis 3, and we are told that that is the very first messianic prophecy. But it said in it that you shall crush his head, and he will crush your heel. This creature, the serpent, he was the one who was going to crush, or perhaps grasp, the heel of the seed of the woman. The word used in that verse is shuf, and there's really no consensus of what that word actually means. It can mean crush, it can mean grasp, and there's several other possibilities of meaning for that word. Well, in Genesis 25, verse 26, Jacob was born grasping onto the heel of his brother. Is he perhaps the serpent? I mean, he is described as smooth-skinned, after all. He's crafty, he's a deceiver, he's a trickster. In fact, the name Yaakov does not stop at the idea of the heel, but it also contains the word akav, which means literally to swell up or out. But it's used in the context of grasping the heel of another which means to circumvent by causing another to stumble. It's this word picture of reaching out and grasping someone's heel so that they stumble so that you can get past them. Restraining another by taking advantage of their weakness. You reach out and you grasp their heel and you're able to hold them in place and keep them from reaching what their their potential. Or it can mean to supplant by tripping up and taking place of the fallen. You're standing in line for something and you grab the foot of the person in front of you and trip them up and then you take their place in the line. And as we read and as we learn more about Jacob, this is the method in which Jacob approaches the world. And if we look at Jacob from the point of view of his name and his moral characteristics, we're left with a person who seems completely irredeemable. He is the embodiment of the serpent. He operates in the way of the serpent. And that is what we're going to see this week. And Jacob, at this point in his life, seems to have no redeemable qualities. And the way that Jacob acts in this Parsha reveals to us the methods of the serpent. And we should not miss this, because I believe that it can reveal to us something of immeasurable value. So let's go ahead and read the Parsha, and then come back and discuss exactly what it is that I'm talking about. Genesis 27, 1 through 29. And it came to be when Yitchak was old, and his eyes were too dim to see, that he called for Esav, his elder son, and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. And he said, See now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt wild game for me. And make me a tasty dish, such as I love, 
and bring it to me to eat in order that my being does bless you before I die. And Rivka heard when Yitshak spoke to Esav his son, and Esav went to the field to hunt wild game and to bring it. And Rivka spoke to Yaakov her son, saying, See, I heard your father speak to Esav your brother, saying, Bring me wild game and make me a tasty dish to eat, and bless you in the presence of Hashem before my death. And now, my son, listen to my voice according to what I command you. Please go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, and I make a tasty dish from them for your father such as he loves. And you shall take it to your father, and he shall eat it, so that he might bless you before his death. And Yaakov said to Rivka his mother, See, Asev, my brother is a hairy man, and I am smooth-skinned. What if my father touches me? Then I shall be like a deceiver in his eyes, and shall bring a curse on myself, and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, get them for me. And he went and fetched them, and brought them to his mother, and his mother made a tasty dish such as his father loved. And Rivka took the best garments of her elder son Asev, which were with her in the house, and put them on Yaakov, her younger son. And she put the skins of the young goat on his hands, and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the tasty dish and the bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son Yaakov. And he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And Yaakov said to his father, I am Asav, your firstborn. I have done as you have said to me. Please rise, sit, and eat of my wild game, so that your being might bless me. But Yitjak said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because Hashem your Elohim brought it to me. And then Yitshak said to Yaakov, Please come near so that I feel you, my son, whether you truly are my son, Asav, or not. And Yaakov went near to Yitshak his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is the voice of Yaakov, but the hands are the hands of Asav. And he did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like his brother Asav's hands, and he blessed him. And he said, Are you truly my son, Asav? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and let me eat of my son's wild game, so that my being might bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Yitshak said to him, Please come near and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his garments, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which Hashem has blessed. And Elohim give you the dew of the heavens, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brothers, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those cursing you, and blessed be those blessing you. Jacob, Israel, the serpent. We know, because we know how the story of Jacob's life ends, we know who he will become. But at this point in the story, he is not yet that man. Jacob, at this point in his life, is still operating in the nature of the serpent. In fact, in Genesis 8.21, it says, The intentions of the heart of man is evil from his youth. And if we pay attention to how the brothers, Jacob and Esau, have been described in chapter 25, and then here in chapter 27, we catch a glimpse of two evil natures warring against each other. Esau is described as hairy, as a hunter, a man of the field, a man concerned with the immediate gratification of desires. He is a beast. Jacob is described as grasping the heel, smooth skin, crafty, subversive. He is a serpent. These two natures are warring against each other, this beast and this serpent, in order to gain favor, to gain honor. In chapter 25, we saw the way of the beast nature, what I just described. Concerned with the immediate, living in the moment, carrying on the philosophy of YOLO. You only live once. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. Chapter 27 then develops for us further the way of the serpent, and we catch in this narrative a glimpse of the method of the previous serpent, the serpent in the garden. You see, the serpent in the garden was crafty and deceptive. In Genesis 3, we are given just a sample of how he operates. In Genesis 2, God gave a command in verse 16 through 17, And Hashem Elohim commanded, saying, Eat of every tree of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. It's a simple command, right? And then in Genesis 3, the Nachash, or serpent, arrives on the scene, and he approaches Eve, and he asks one simple question. Is it true that God has said, do not eat of every tree of the garden? The simple answer is no, that's not true. God said, eat of every tree of the garden, except one. Now, this might seem like being picky over a sticking point. All he did was he reversed the question, right? He changed it from eat 
all but one to you can't really eat them all, can you? And the subtlety here is something that we have to recognize. And I believe it will give us the pointer to something incredible happening in Genesis 27. And the serpent is, in essence, appealing to a seeming lack. God is holding out on you. There's something that you can have if only you reach out and you take it for yourself. How does Eve respond to this question from the serpent? She says, oh, we can eat of every tree of the garden except for the one in the midst. Okay, good enough so far. Of that tree, God said, do not eat and do not touch it, lest you die. Is Eve recounting God's command correctly? Well, no, she added to the command. She added, do not touch. The serpent then gets Eve to question what she knows. He says, you won't die. God's holding out on you. You could be great. You could be like God. You can supplant him. God simply doesn't want you to be as amazing as he is. He doesn't want you to have all of the wisdom and the things that he's holding back from you. He is, in fact, preventing you from reaching your full potential. That's what the serpent is saying. So let's return to Genesis 27. Well, what we see in Genesis 27 is a reversal of sorts. It is Rebecca acting in the role of the serpent, and it is Jacob, the one with the serpent-like descriptive words, who takes the place of Eve. Isaac is old, and he gives instructions to his son Esau, go, get me some of that tasty wild game that I love so much. Make me a meal, and I will bless you. The connection between a meal and blessing should not be lost on us, but that's for another time. Rebecca overhears the command that was given and goes to Jacob and presents a way in which Jacob could receive the blessing for himself. She adds something to her story. Isaac had simply told Esau, in order that my nephesh might bless you before I die. But what Rebekah says is that I might bless you in the presence of Hashem before I die. This addition that she gives appeals to God's name, and it appeals to the desire to be closer to God. It presents this idea, God will hold out on you and keep you from your full potential unless you reach out and you grasp this blessing for yourself. Well, Jacob at first, he resists. Not that it is wrong, but that it will never work. How could I possibly pass as Esau? If I do this and I'm caught, I will be as a deceiver or a mocker in his eyes. The word used in that verse is ta'a, and it most literally means a cheater. So, if I am caught, I will be cursed, kalal, and not blessed. Rebecca responds that if he is cursed, the curse will pass on to her. Now, I bet if you think about this whole scenario, you'll see what I was talking about earlier. The serpent nature is rearing its head. Rebecca is taking on the role of the serpent and tempting her son to seize for himself a role that was not naturally his. But she had a prophecy, right? God had told her that this was going to happen, so let's make it happen. If we wait even one minute longer, we run the risk of losing the blessing forever. Jacob agrees to the deception, and he takes on the role of the serpent himself before his father. So if we turn back to Genesis 3, 6 then, what was the pattern of temptation that we looked at in that chapter? C. Define as good and pleasant, take and eat, and then give. Well, Isaac is blind. He cannot see. And so, in this state, he must rely on his other senses, and that's exactly what he does. In fact, all five senses are present in this chapter. First, there's the command. Get me a tasty dish. What was it that Eve defined for the fruit upon examination? That it was good for food and pleasant to the eyes. It was a tasty dish. With Isaac's eyes gone, the sense of taste stands in as the mean of divining desirable and good. Jacob then passes before each of his father's remaining four senses before the blessing. First, there's the sense of sound. You do not sound like Esau. Then there's the sense of touch. Come near so that I can feel you. Then there's the sense of taste. Let me eat of my son's wild game. And finally, the sense of smell. See, the smell of my son is like that of a field. Of Jacob's remaining senses, only one told him that something was amiss. Only one reported back that perhaps he should reconsider. This one is the one that is reported all through Scripture as being the one that leads to faith and obedience. 
only one sense that leads to righteousness, and that is the sense of hearing. Now, that can be very difficult for our modern sensibilities. It's sight and touch that are defined by science as the senses that determine our reality. I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard from atheists, if I can't see it and if I can't touch it, then I'm not going to believe it. But the Bible says differently. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Romans 10.17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Exodus 19.5 says, Now if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And Psalm 81.11, But my people did not listen to my voice, and Israel would not submit to me. In the book of Exodus, God is never seen, even at Mount Sinai, with him at the top and all of the people of Israel at the base of the mountain. But his voice is heard on so many occasions in that book and all through the Torah. The Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, opens with the idea of hearing. This word Shema means not only hear, but also obey. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, right? Shema means to hear, but it also means to obey. And if you pay very close attention to Scripture, you will find this idea running from one end of Scripture to the other. In fact, this chapter seems to be trying to make this point, because three times in this chapter, twice in this Parsha and once in the next, the phrase, obey my voice, is used. And each time, it comes from one source. It comes from Rebecca. Genesis 27, verse 8, 13, and 43. Those three instances, we get a picture of the pattern of Genesis 3, when she says, Obey my voice and my command. And then she says, Obey my voice and get the food. And then finally she says, Obey my voice and be exiled. You see, the thing is, we don't know what may have happened had Jacob stayed and refused to listen to his mother. Oh, sure, we could speculate. People have speculated for ages on what could have happened had Jacob not done this. There may have been a better way for this prophecy to be fulfilled, a way which would not have required deception. But the fact is, we will never know. We can never know. Isaac, however, this great patriarch, he did not obey his sense of hearing. His other senses and the content of what he heard conspired against him as he didn't listen to the voice, the sound of the voice. You see, our world and our fleshly senses will conspire against us to present to us a world that is contrary to the truth of righteousness. We have two voices in our heads, one whose voice we recognize and who tells us the way to go. That tells us to not pay attention to our other senses. It tells us to focus on God and His Word and to do the correct thing in any given circumstance. And the other, the other speaks sweet words. It says, you can be blessed. You can be like God. In fact, God wants you to have this. He has given you a promise after all. Or it can say, God is holding out on you. You can be better than or equal to Him. Simply bow and worship me, and all the kingdoms of the world will be yours. Most importantly, this voice says, You deserve. God is holding out. You can be greater. You can be famous. You can be loved by all. You can be rich. You deserve it. You are entitled. This was the counterpoint to Genesis 3 6 that we looked at so long ago. This example we have of overcoming temptation is epitomized in the temptation of Yeshua, when three times he heard the words of the adversary, and three times he responded with the word of God, that which he had learned since his youth, that which was contrary to his senses and his circumstances. And this is the reason why we must know scripture. The adversary, our world, our society, Every voice out there is trying to drown out the one voice that pierces the darkness of our own hearts. And regardless of who listened to whom or how the deed was accomplished, it was accomplished. Jacob received the blessing. He became the de facto heir of the household of Isaac and the household of Abraham. 
and the full fallout from him resorting to this means to take the blessing from his brother, it hasn't yet been fully realized. And I don't mean yet as in we haven't gotten there in the story, but I mean yet as in the course of human history has not yet resolved this conflict. And this is what we talked about two weeks ago. Despite the course of our own lives, the blessings and the curses that are realized in our own lives will long outlive us. We cannot simply live for our own lives, but for the lives of all future generations that will follow. This brings us to the greatest difference between Jacob and Esau. One a beast, the other a serpent, neither worthy on a moral scale. But if we apply our other scale and our other lenses, the lenses of life versus death, then we can clearly say that Jacob was the natural choice for the blessing to pass on to. His life was one that fostered and grew life. His concern was for more than just monetary gratification. Esau was not concerned about anything more than his immediate gratification. His lifestyle was one where he did not foster and did not care for the lives of animals that he took. He cared for sport. He cared for violence. He cared for immediacy, for gratification. His life was lived according to these principles. And once more we see clearly that the matters that God looks to have very little to do with morality. They have to do with life. Proper morality is only one small part of life, and so Jacob receives the blessing. Now, we've previously touched on attempting to seize a blessing for yourself, right? We talked about it last week, even. We talked about it with Ishmael, the idea that God has prophesied or promised something, and so I will go out and do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. And this is what happens here once again. Jacob and Rebekah conspire together to make the prophecy happen. They don't wait for God to accomplish it through his means, but now that it's done, now comes the fallout. Jacob will receive an exile of sorts. Jacob will spend 20 years separated from his family and from this land of promise. Jacob will be on the receiving end of this very same deception, not just once, but multiple times, from father-in-law, children, and wives. Jacob has to pay the consequences for the means by which he seized control of the promise that God made. And we see other times in Scripture where a counterpoint to this occurs, the one being the one that I mentioned earlier, Yeshua's temptation, Yeshua born to the line of David, Yeshua the rightful king of Israel, the eternal king to sit on the eternal throne. In his temptation, that offer was made. You can be king of the world now. Simply bow to me and I'll see that it happens. And he resisted that. Later on the way to the cross, he reveals to his disciples what must happen and Peter contradicts him. Peter says, that will never happen. You're not going to die. And Yeshua rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. He knew where that thought of seizing power came from. Power was his. Authority was his. It was not his to grasp. It was already his that had been received. And then finally, as he hung on the cross, the taunts of the mockers in his ears, those taunts of, save yourself, and the thought of calling on a legion of angels to come and to relieve him of the suffering must have hung heavily on his thoughts. He could have seized it for himself. And if he had, we all would have paid dearly for it. There's another example of this very thing as well, a David. As a young boy, David was anointed king, while Saul sat on the throne. And on two occasions, David had the opportunity to simply reach out his hand and take hold of the crown. Saul was in his grasp, and David was actively persecuted and hunted by Saul. God had promised it after all. It was his. Why not simply step out in faith and do the detestable things that would see the promise come to pass? But the man after God's own heart did not do this. He did not seize the kingdom away from the man who was actively perverting the power that he had been given. Jacob, though, Jacob reached out. Jacob actively deceived his father and he tripped up his brother. And he spent the remainder of his life living out the consequences of this action. He lived under a blessing while in exile. And what we will get into in the next few months, it can teach us some pretty profound stuff about our own role as blessed exiles. 
before we get there, we need to know the terms of that blessing. The blessing that Jacob was given. In some ways, it's fulfilled in Jacob's life. In other ways, he never sees the promise realized in his lifetime. So what are the terms of the blessing that Isaac gives to Jacob? May God bless you through creation, through the dew of the heavens to water your crops in the summers, the fatness of the earth, in other words, reap plenty from your fields and your flocks, and have plenty of grain and wine. He's describing a type of abundance. This part of the blessing is one that Jacob does see realized in his lifetime, at least in some ways. We'll read about how God blesses Jacob with increasing flocks while he's still in Laban's household. Jacob also receives the blessing in a way that his parents did not. He has 12 sons, which is the realization of a blessing that was spoken over Abraham. Jacob also gets to live out the last 17 years of his life in the land of Goshen, a land of plenty. But there's the second part of the blessing, and that part of the blessing could be summed up as authority. Let people serve you, let nations bow to you. Be master over your brother, and your brother's sons bow to you. This part is never realized in Jacob's life. Laban never bows to Jacob. Jacob serves Laban for years. Upon his return, it's Jacob that finds himself bowing to his brother seven times. Esau never bows to Jacob that we read of. Shechem doesn't bow to Jacob. Pharaoh doesn't bow to Jacob. In fact, the only person that we read of to bow to Jacob before his death is Joseph in Genesis 48. His son, not his brother. No nations ever served Jacob. In fact, we read of very few people that ever do serve Jacob. His household at the time of his descending into Egypt is all of 70 people. Jacob doesn't have the great resources of his father. Why? Because he was forced to run away and leave it behind. Now, this part of the blessing is only later fulfilled in Joseph. And in the text... It's Joseph's brothers that come to bow before him. In Jacob's blessing over his own sons in Genesis 49, 8, Judah is blessed with a very similar blessing. Your father's children bow down before you. But this particular blessing was not fulfilled in Judah until nearly six to 800 years later, when David takes the throne of Israel. This recognition that the blessings that are given to us are not always for us in the immediate is something that we spoke on two weeks ago as well. The blessing that God gives a person do not always look like blessings to the person living in the midst of hardship. Many times, the blessings of God are simply things that are carried out in our children or grandchildren. And that's where the story will go in just two weeks. Living in blessing while existing in exile. Too many times we get caught up in how we are blessed and We get upset when we don't see that blessing taking place in our own lives. But that's the pattern of life. That's the pattern of the Bible. There's so much going on in this week's Parsha for us to consider. And I had to just boil it down to just one thing. If there's just one thing for us to focus on for the rest of this episode, I think it would be the tendency for us as humans to trust in our own senses. To deny what we hear as long as we can touch or taste or see. After all, our current experience defines all of existence, right? What we can observe is what is true. And that's what the Enlightenment has taught us. And that is what science demands of us. What is written, what we hear from God, that should always be questioned and examined in light of our own experience. And if our experience differs from His Word, then we're taught to go with our experience. And if our desires are contrary to his word, we are taught to go with our desires. Our own mind will wage war on us in an attempt to get us to go the way of the flesh. But there's something else that we must listen to. We must learn to shema, to hear and to obey in the Hebrew understanding. Without obedience, one hasn't truly heard. And hearing is not a passive action in Hebrew thought. And that's what it means to live in faith. And that's what it means to discern. So discernment. I've been trying to discern, if you will, when to approach this topic. And we'll have several opportunities when we get to Leviticus to really delve into this topic. But then again, Leviticus is more than a year off. So I decided to take a few moments to at least understand this topic of discernment. Throughout scripture, we're told that a believer should act with discernment. 
people make requests of God for discernment, usually in connection to wisdom, understanding, and judgment in making proper decisions. It's this that Solomon asks for in 1 Kings 3.9, an understanding mind that can discern good and evil. It's discerning that Joseph is called by Pharaoh when he is able to interpret his dreams in Genesis 41.39, and in order to appear as discerning before the people that Pharaoh gives as a reason for elevating Joseph in the first place in 41.33. It's discernment that Daniel is gifted with by God in Daniel 9.22, and it's discernment that is removed from the people at God's will in Isaiah 6, 9-10. If we stop here, discernment seems to be a gift of God that he gives and he takes away at will. It is perhaps what Isaac experienced in this chapter as he became unable to discern Jacob from Esau. Now, if this is the case, that it's only a gift from God that is given and taken away, then we can simply sit back and he will give or not as he sees fit. However, Scripture doesn't stop here in its discussion of discernment. Scripture describes for us a way to gain discernment for ourselves. In Psalm 119, verse 66, discernment is taught from God's commands. In Hosea 14, 9, discernment is found in God's commands. Nehemiah 8, 9, discernment is given by the teachers of the Word of God. The book of Proverbs was given to impart wisdom and discernment, according to Proverbs 1, 2. In Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 6, it's living out God's commands that will witness to the world about a person's own discernment. It's discernment that's taught And it is God's Torah, his instruction, that imparts discernment. All throughout scripture we read that. And how is God's word spread? It's spread through word, through reading and teaching, through listening and hearing. It is this discernment that's taught by God's word that begins with hearing and then passes to all other senses over time and with practice. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What was the milk of the oracles of God to the readers of Hebrews? It was the Tanakh, as the Old Testament. And it's this that the readers of Hebrews needed to be taught anew in order to be able to discern properly. And discernment begins in defining things according to the Word of God as revealed in Scripture. And as we read through Scripture in many cases throughout the Bible, discernment is steeped in the terms of good and evil, or good versus evil. And if we stop there, it's easy to say, well, good versus evil is indeed the proper way to look at our existence and to ensure that what we do is right and good and correct. But if we follow the theme of good throughout Genesis, we'll find that good and evil can only be defined once everything is in place, once a series of events have been fully completed. And we will usually find that in the midst of what is defined as good in the end, there's a whole lot of bad and evil present. If we examine Genesis 1 much closer, we find that good was only defined once each piece was in place. And then if we turn all the way to the end and we look at Genesis 50, we read that man intended for evil, but God intended for good. Let's remember, it's not the tree of good versus evil, but rather good and evil, because these two ideas, they are intricately interwoven together. Great evil can be done and ultimate good can come from it. Great good can come and very real evil can be the result. Discerning good from bad, it's a great skill, and it can demonstrate great wisdom. But without the underlying principle to guide us, it's not enough. Solomon knew good and bad, after all, and he chose to define certain things as good. Riches, wives, treaties, peace, power, and more. Things that are good, but that are not the things of life in the way that he practiced it. Discernment of good versus evil is advisable. But it is not the end game. If Solomon had made his choices of what to define as good and evil based on a scale of life versus death, would he have been a greater king than he was? Would he have been kept from making many of the bad decisions that he made in his life? What about Isaac right here in this chapter? If discernment is something that's given and taken away by God, then is it possible that Isaac's discernment was removed by God in order for the prophecy to be realized? 
in order for this bad thing of Jacob, stealing from his brother and taking for himself so that life might be realized in the end. Perhaps it was Rebekah and Jacob's serpent nature, the one that is crafty that allowed them to pinpoint the time to strike. The serpent nature is not all bad after all. We ourselves are told to be crafty as a serpent by our Messiah. Matthew 10.16 says, See, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. As I said before, we cannot truly know what might have happened. This is beyond the scope of our discernment. We can, however, learn from the story. We can learn that even if we accomplish God's will, we will suffer the consequences of going about it improperly. If we do not remain innocent as doves in the midst of our craftiness in dealing with the world, there will be consequences to us as a people. There will be consequences to future generations. And this is why it's so vital that we learn discernment. The path between craftiness and innocence is a fine line. Without discernment, we will fall to one side or the other. And so I pray that God help us to accurately be able to discern His wisdom in the paths that we face in our lives. As we go forward in our lives, we have to remind ourselves and remember to derish chai in all that we do, to seek life. Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Derish Chai. If you would like to find out more or support this ministry, head over to SeekLifeSC.com. That's SeekLifeSC.com. We'll see you again next time as we dare as we seek life. Shalom.